I am very pleased to introduce today's lecturer, Jeff Peachy. He is the owner of Peachy Conservation LLC based in New York City, and he specializes in preserving the intrinsic artifactual aesthetic and historic values of books. In his 30 plus years of experience, he has taught book conservation workshops internationally and has been awarded numerous fellowships to support his book history research. He is a visiting instructor for the Library and Archives Conservation Education Consortium of Buffalo State, also New York University's Conservation Center, the Vinterthur University of Delaware, and you can find him at jeffpeachy.com and peachytools.com. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to talk about the craft of hand pairing leather today, and we're going to kind of start big with maybe some notions about what craft is and then get really, really, really granular with kind of the hand motions of when I'm uh, pairing leather and then kind of go step back a little and get bigger and talk about maybe some of the thoughts that are going on in my head when I'm demonstrating the craft of pairing leather. I, I wanted to call this the craft because it's a skill that you can learn. And I think anybody that works with leather has to learn this to some degree. So today I'm going to talk about 20 minute PowerPoint, some common leathers for book binding, why is leather paired, some examples of historic pairing, and then kind of the most common types of pairing that is done both from the industrial standpoint and from the bookbinder standpoint. And then I'm going to do a live demo, starting with boarding. And then here's the tightrope part, or the party trick, as some call it. I'm going to attempt to edge pair all four edges in one piece with my M2 hybrid knife, and then kind of go in and just start to work with some overall and some edge pairing. And I'll talk a little bit about that too. The most common leathers that we use in bookbinding um, are goat, sheep, calf, and pig. The goat is probably most common today, and that's what I'm going to demonstrate with, and it's a goat skin. If you're a native English speaker, we naturally talk about goat skin or sheep skin and cow hides. Hides are bigger and weaker, so they're generally not used for books. Goat skin is a kind of a many, many different types of textures, grain surfaces. Each skin is, is truly unique, so it's up to the binder to kind of pick the best area to use for the book. Sheep skin tends tended to uh, occupy the bottom end of the market for most of history. It looks a lot like calf. And in fact, I don't know if you can see, but on the, the surface, you see how the, the grain surface is delaminating on this uh, 18th century book and peeled away. So that's because the sheep is kind of fatty, and that's one reason it was cheap, and they're, they're kind of big. But this is often the only way you can tell the difference between sheep and calf, is if the grain layer is delaminating and peeling away like this. Calf is probably the next step up from sheep historically, and again, this was often... In the 18th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, considered not attractive enough for high-end books and not durable enough, so there were a variety of decorative techniques applied. You can see the one kind of in the front has a staining, or it was called in the 19th century marbling. Pig was used earlier, and the skin is sort of easily identified by the three little hair follicles that go completely through the grain layer. Calf is very smooth. It's kind of neat that skins are still something, when bookbinders buy a skin, they buy the entire skin. So this is the skin of a goat on the far right that's been flattened out. So you can see the head is at the top and it's got the four feet and the spine runs down the middle. And what binders often do is make a, a mat or something to locate the best area of the skin for the, the most you know aesthetically pleasing area. And if you look on the far left, that chart, this is from 1905, um, you can see how much stronger the skin is at, at various parts. Binders also tend to choose the uh, the strongest part of the skin to use on the book. In the middle, this is a 18th century plate, but I found this very interesting just because not only was the tail tanned, but you can see that they cut out the areas around the eye of the head too, just to really, I mean, this is true snout to tail kind of use of the leather skin. We don't do that so much anymore. And there's two basic types of book binding leathers, tanned skin and tawed skin. The vegetable tan skin, which bookbinders use, are made of two types. There's either uh, pyrogallo, which is the longest lasting, sumac, oak, chestnut are the common tannins used to, to preserve the leather like this. And there's also some uh, condensed tannins that are sometimes used like mimosa that are not so stable. So they're generally not used for uh, fine binding or conservation purposes. 
example of a book found in vegetable tan goat skin on, on the left, and on the right is a model of a 15th century German book. This is actually bound in alum tawed deer skin that uh, Jesse Meyer from Pergamina prepared. It's a, it's a beautiful little skin, not historic, but it was a fun skin to work with. Why is leather paired? So this is this is kind of the big uh, craft issue. Craft generally wants to be seamless, right? When, when we're making something with tr traditional craftsmanship in mind, we kind of want it to appear to be seamless. With leather, there's a couple ways to do this. One is by turning in, which you can see on the left, and this is the way it's dealt with with books. Um, so the leather has to be very thin to mold it over the edge of the book and also to mold a uh, head cap, which is kind of an aesthetic thing, and they vary uh, significantly throughout the centuries, the shape of them. So this is just kind of a mid-19th century shape that I'm showing there. And you can see how thin the leather is on the surface of the board. On the upper right-hand corner, different trades deal with this issue of seamlessness different ways. Here's a knife case I made, and I just uh, waxed and burnished the edge of this very thick horse butt leather. Other ways are to butt join the leather. To the left of that is it's a dice cup for shaking dice. And you can see that it's a very thick leather that's butt joined, and then there's two cuts made on either side of that where this hidden sewing goes in to create this rounded cylinder with a base. Apart from aesthetics, we need to pair the leather to get the book to function properly. So the book on the bottom here on the right, I rebound that. It's a, it was a 17th century text. I rebound it in calf. But this is like what I consider a really, really good opening. The book completely lies flat. The page is open flat. It's got nice throw up, nice drape. Throw up is the amount the spine moves. Drape is the amount the papers lay. This was a, a very successful rebinding, in my opinion, which is kind of rare in conservation. Generally, we try to keep all the existing elements. A 16th century leather pairing. I'm lucky enough to have a couple of very, very mold damaged books so you can actually see what's going on. This is the interface of one of the of the front board of a 16th century German book, Alum Todd Pigskin. So you can see how the pigskin kind of gets darker. Uh, it's not that bright white that we saw earlier. And this paste down has mostly deteriorated anyways. So I was able to see a couple interesting things. You can see that the turn-ins are cut out on the board. You can see the knife slits on the board. And there's really no edge pairing, which we're gonna do today. Edge pairing is kind of a gradual thinning. But here the leather was about 20 thousandths of an inch throughout and there was no edge pairing. Here's another book, uh, extremely water damaged. So I'm not actually opening the cover of the book here. I'm just opening up the leather that was still stuck to the spine, but had completely detached from the board. Again, this is an excellent opportunity for me to measure the thickness and we come up with 20 thousandths of an inch and no parent edge pairing. Again, interesting. It, it points to a different kind of cooperation between the, the tanners and the binders of the time. They worked with each other very well to give things so everybody could work efficiently. One, one pretty nice thing about leather being acidic is that it often burns through the end sheets, especially if they're plain, so you can get a very good idea of how big the turn-ins are. Much like the head and the tail on the leather, uh, leather was used uh, very, very efficiently. So as long as there was enough leather to turn it in a millimeter, meter or so over the paste down, which is the part on the left there that is the final step in making a book, you're good to go. And you can see the irregular turn-ins here. Here they appear to be uh, edge paired. And you can also see right under that book plate in the middle, and you see like it's kind of an angled, like an envelope almost um, going in. Um, that's either a stub or a paste down that's been cut out. But you can see how much even just one more piece of paper keeps the leather from burning into the flyleaf and sometimes further into the text block as well. Probably most people that are taught fine binding or traditional binding now do this kind of thing with their turn-ins. They'll edge pair their leather, they'll turn it in. These are both goat skin. The leather on the left is a straight grain goat skin. I'm not sure, it's just a goat skin on the right. These were paired very, very thin, about 10 thousandths of an inch. And once it was covered, they were trimmed out and there was a paper liner put over and then the paste down was put. So again, this is to bring everything up kind of an even thickness so you don't feel a lump from this or that. It's a seamless idea and craft. We want it to be a seamless and look like it was born and not created by somebody. This is also the reason a lot of 19th century books are falling apart. In addition to the structural aspects of the very thin leather, the leather itself was quickly tanned with uncondensed tannins and often is in terrible shape. What I'm going to demonstrate is kind of a, a 20th century fine binding sort of pairing. 
if you can imagine a book laying out, I'll show this again later, I'm going to pair a little bit in onto the boards and then to the very edge of the leather and the spine a little bit and the head cap area. How thick, this is often the first question would be yes. how thick do I pair the leather? The common answer is, well, it depends. Depends what you're doing. The thinner leather gets, the weaker it gets. So for conservation purposes, we try to leave the leather as thick as possible. For fine binding purposes, sometimes you want the leather paired to like a, a almost a see-through kind of thickness so that it's more the aesthetics of it. There's a variety of ways to measure leather thickness. I usually think in thousandths of an inch, which is the decimal inches here, but there's also ounces, millimeters, fractions fractional and irons, which is kind of like an old system of measurement that I haven't been able to find out where that actually comes from yet. People might think, you know, 16 thousandths of an inch right there. I mean, what is that? Most people that are involved in bookbinding probably know that thousandths of an inch are what we call points also. A 16 thousandths of an inch would be 16 points or 98 thousandths of an inch would be 0 0.098 and so on. Industrial splitting. So this is what the, the tanner would do before we get the leather. And even today, you can get leather split down to one millimeter two or, or whatever. And it's like a, it's kind of like a big bandsaw without any teeth, but operates horizontally and the skin just kind of slips through there. It's, uh, I've heard the machines take a lot of maintenance and they're, they're kind of tricky to operate. So even today, some tanners send it to a specialty splitter to handle that aspect. For people that are working in production work, the Fortuna is kind of a machine they might use or maybe used in the recent past. It uses a circular kind of blade that you can see down on the bottom. And the, the whole thing looks like a little sewing machine. This just does the turn in. So it does like an inch or so that allows you, you to turn in the, the leather. And again, again these, these machines kind of take, you need a learning curve to operate these kind of things. Most binders use either one of these two types of double-edged razor blade pairing machines. The leather is pulled through and they're, they're great for doing large flat areas. I kind of prefer the Brockman machine just because it's a little bit simpler, but he doesn't make those anymore. And the, uh, the Sharfix is probably the main machine that people use. And they're, they're really excellent for labels. The drawback of these is if you're trying to pair a large area and you're pulling it through the machine, you'll still have to go back in with a knife or a spoke shave or something to even out these little ridges that develop in between them. People like it also because you don't have to uh, resharpen the double-edged blade, you just replace it. And uh, my favorite blades are feather, by the way. There's some double-edged razor blade planes that were kind of marketed to also model makers and that sort of thing, like in the 50s. And they actually kind of work on leather. They're a little uncontrollable. I don't want to risk an expensive piece of leather doing this. And I tried on the very far left, I tried to make like a better version of this, but for about a week, I just gave up. Uh, I, I milled mine out of a solid uh, billet of aluminum and it had some little magnets to help keep the blade in place, but uh, it just did not work as well as a spoke shave or even just a, a plain knife. And this is the uh, Spoke shave, so most binders use a modified 151 spoke shave. This kind of started in the 1920s. Previously, they would use kind of a, a round knife or a French sort of knife to gradually scrape away the thickness. The spoke shave, it's quick, it's safe, and it's a, it's a very effective way of getting long gradual bevels, or if you're doing a reback, the same thing, get a gradual bevel and get your turn ends nice and thin. And James Brockman, who did the razor blade pairing machine we saw earlier, um, came up with this idea of a little shavings collector that uh, he lets me copy for the, the ones I sell. Previously, round knives were used. Um, they're often called uh, French knives or a Swiss knife if it doesn't have a handle. Other trades, leather working trades, cobblers also use uh, round knives like these. Straight knives. I used to use a straight knife, English style knife, uh, exclusively until a few years ago. I, I switched to kind of a hybrid shape. The one on the upper right-hand corner on the bottom there is a traditional Barnsley knife that are still available. And then there's two of the ones I make. One is out of an A2 steel and one is out of an M2 steel. And I make the M2 steel as a hacksaw blade. So I actually make that out of a hacksaw blade and grind it. The bottom one I bought from a cobbler in Vietnam, and that was also made out of a Russian hacksaw blade. And this was in Hue, and he'd set up like a little sheet on the sidewalk, and he was just like an itinerant cobbler. And I walked over, and uh, after some, some, he figured out that I wanted to buy the knife, and he named a price, and I paid it, and I was happy, and he was happy. And I took about 10 steps away and looked back, and I saw he was 
this is in the morning. He was closing up for the day already. He's like, you know, it was this was like a good transaction. We were both really happy. He sold this knife for probably what he considered an exorbitant sum, and I bought the knife for what I considered a, a very cheap sum. So just interesting to see these hacksaw blades used on leather around the world. And it's it's my favorite steel for leather, to tell you the truth. Uh, this is the hybrid knife that I'm going to be demoing with. I said I grind these out of a hacksaw. They have a wooden core that I carve and uh, use a hatchet. I find it's uh, more comfortable to hold and easier to hold if it has these uh, irregular areas. And then it, it also makes it a lot easier to hold if it's covered with leather. It just kind of grips your hand much better than if you're holding onto a piece of wood or something, I find. Arthur Johnson, who wrote a really good book binding manual, in my opinion, it's the one that I started with. He claims that one of the most admired skills in book binding is the pairing of leather, yet only sharp tools and confidence are required. Confidence is gained by experience, and sharp tools are available from bgtools.com. So after the binder decides what area of the skin that they want to use, I've already cut mine out here. The leather is boarded. And that just means it's rolled back and forth in all four directions, corners to corner, side to side, edge to edge. This used to be done uh, on an industrial basis with this tool. Um, this is actually from a leather factory. And it, the worker would put there, uh, the bottom is a corrugated uh, brass actually so the worker would put their this thing is heavy <laughs> they put their arm in here and just all day kind of roll the leather to make it supple uh, over itself nowadays people either often just use their hands or a little piece of cork and i'm going to be using just a little piece of cork i got um, here is my leather just to show you so if this is the book the two boards are here and the spine here, and then it's about an inch, which is going to be the turn ins for the thing. So it's kind of, again, if you're not quite clear, this is what that looks like with the front board, the spine, and the back board. And I'm going to edge pair all around there. Uh, but first, I'm going to board it and I'm going to use the cork, and that just means folding it over itself like this. There's two sides to a piece of leather there's the grain side and or the hair side and the flesh side. So uh, the flesh side is the side that's uh, removed from the flesh. If you have worked in leather and you haven't done this, uh, I think you will notice it. it is an absolute incredible difference when you board the leather and soften it up. Sometimes there's kind of hard spots in the leather the, the blade or your razor blade can kind of run on. Uh, this just, uh, it evens up the whole skin and gets it nice and soft. There's another type of boarding kind of done right before you cover, and that's more to raise the grain uh, on the surface. Um, this is just to uh, break everything down in the skin and get it ready for pairing. And for me, it's kind of a, I often uh, like to feel it with my fingers, too. Uh, it's kind of a meditative process that you're just uh, thinking about getting ready to do the pairing and, and uh, not not screwing up your uh, expensive piece of leather. Uh, leather, good quality vegetable tanned leather today is still, uh, you know, very expensive. A good skin can cost uh, 250 300 bucks. So it's the kind of thing you don't want to uh, waste if you can avoid it. So somebody's asking the question, boarding, flesh side to flesh side? Hair, hair side to hair side, grain side to grain side. The, the flesh side's on the outside. Is that a litho stone you're working on? This is a litho stone, yeah. Um, I usually don't work on litho stones because I think they sh they're exhausted pretty much and they should be kept for printers, but it looks good on camera and it's uh, the... The color of a lithostone is kind of close to 18% gray, so it just kind of works out well. Um, usually what I, I use is just if a big piece of glass or marble or something. It also gets very reflective, so this is why I'm using a lithostone now. But uh, If you have one, uh, treasure it because they are <laughs> exhausted. I can feel the leather. It's, just, it's uh, starting to feel good, and I can just feel it between my fingers if there's any little bits left that I need to work. I 
and I have prepared my knife and stropped it and everything, so I'm ready to roll, but I will uh, show you that uh, in a minute. So now for the party trick. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is, so if you think of the thickness of, uh, so I'm, this is like an edge view of the leather. So I'm going to make, and I'm coming in with my knife kind of like this. First, I'm going to cut off maybe about that much. And then I'm going to kind of come in and cut off about that much. And then I'm going to kind of come in and cut off about that much. And then I'm just going to do some scraping and scraping to get a, a long, gradual bevel on this. And I'm just going to start. I'm not going to start at the end. because That's very difficult. I'm just going to, I'm going to come around the corner here and get the end a little bit later. Um, I'm sure my knife is sharp, I hope. I will put a different camera angle on so you can see this a little better. But I'm not. I'm not like holding the knife and doing this freehand or anything. I'm I'm running everything on my fingers here, and that holds holds it at the right angle. And I actually use these three fingers here that I kind of use as a jig. Okay, so now I'm starting coming in. There's a couple things you got to think about when you're well. There's actually a lot you got to think about when you're uh, pairing leather. So I'm coming up to the corner here. I'm going to switch directions here and push instead of with the tip so I'm coming over like that the corners are the tricky part come back you know I'm just taking off what is that like five millimeters or something yikes okay whoo well, they got a little thin there that's this is the spine of the animal here so sometimes there's like calcium deposits or something so I'll be careful when I come back down on the other side okay I'm getting close to the edge here come in quite see there we go got that coming around this is side uh, three i think so again i'm just uh, kind of showing off here this is usually not how i pair though it's it's definitely kind of cool to do if you're in a situation where you're class or presenting or something okay so you get this little bit there there we go okay good coming around okay that's good i'm feeling it uh, there's a lot going on with what I'm thinking about here. I'm not going to talk about that just yet. Just let me get around to all this kind of stuff first. And now come around. Last little bit there. Pushing it forward. Okay. And why stop at one, right? Let's see if we can go all the way around another time. Looking good. You know, you almost feel like you're flying through the leather when you're... Uh oh okay. Oh, well. Still, still not bad. One kind of long piece there. So I did five sides. So, okay, enough of that. I don't know if you can see it, but every time you pair leather, somehow magically these little bits appear under your skin. So you always have to make sure to keep everything really clean on that. Do you moisten the leather before pairing? I don't. I know, uh, especially with calf, some people do. I, I've just never found it necessary. And it, it it just makes it more difficult, so I, I don't. Does leather have a grain direction like paper? It doesn't. Uh, when we talk about leather grain, it's kind of the, the surface, right, that, that sort of grain, so it's not the same as paper grain at all. Generally, the, the spine of the animal is lined up with the spine of the book just because the, you know, the goat's running around and runs into a fence or a barbed wire or something, and they it gets scarred or scratched there, so it's kind of a way to hide those sort of imperfections, too. Can you, how do you get rid of the acidity of leather? Can you? Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a really has been a really prevalent topic for uh, quite some time now. Uh, leather is fairly acid, very acidic, as we saw from some of the leather burn in on those those books. And for conservation purposes. Well, the short answer is nobody really knows how to make a leather that has the working properties that are necessary for book binding to make something that's that's more durable than uh, a, a good quality tanned leather. Um, Todd leathers um, are more durable than tanned, but they're really not appropriate for, for many time periods. In the 17th and 18th centuries, binders would decorate their calf bindings, and they'd often apply coatings of 
potash or soda ash to them, which does buffer the leather a little bit. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering if that might help preserve it a bit, but uh, there's really no way to make leather uh, more durable. The way to, to if you want to bind a book in leather and there, there are, you know, it's, it's beautiful and it, if it's, you do everything right, they can last a very long time. Um, you need to think of ways to structurally make your book sound even if the leather fails, or should I say, when the leather fails. Is calf boarded or only goat? I board everything. What are the differences between A2 and M2 blades? I, I don't have all that information off the top of my head, but it all has to do with, they're both high-speed steel metals, and it all has to do with trace amounts of molybdenum, chromium, vanadium. They're all like 0.0014 different. And so there's there's like over a thousand types of steel. And for some reason, this M2, which is just the name that the companies give it, it just seems to work best with leather. And when I strop it, it seems to strop back into shape quicker than the A2. When I started making knives I had a number of different steels tested and that, those results are on my log if you want to look at like how this the steels lasted in a test situation what the company in England does that tests them is they take a card that's loaded with silica and then they measure how many times the knife goes back and forth and how deeply it penetrates into that how do you keep your knives sharp or how should you keep your knives sharp that's a, that's a that's about a two-day question. The simple answer is once I have a knife that's cutting well, like this one, I'll just strop it and strop it and strop it until it doesn't cut anymore. And it, it won't cut because the blade angle will be too obtuse. And then I'll go back and go through my sharpening system. And I, I usually use a grip progression of like 80, 40, 15, 5, 1 microns to do that. The participant, Sam, says Smith did a fair bit of what he called Merrill, and he would pair yeah. off the pieces for adding on. How would one pair the pastiche character of Merrill? Morel is basically what he would do would be take all these pieces of waste and glue them all together and roll them up like a sausage and then kind of slice off little bits. So he, I think from my, under, my understanding is he generally used it in kind of an onlay. So you just have to figure out a way to, to slice up your, your sandwich or whatever, you know, make it a block or whatever um, to cut off pieces. Um, but it's nothing I've ever done, <laughs> to tell you the truth. So pairing. So what I'm going to think of, I've kind of done this one pass here, number one. I'm going to think about number two and three. And even though I'm kind of talking about these as different things, um, a lot of it just depends what you're kind of feeling with the leather. Like you see how that, that my knife's, it's not sticking out too far here. It's not coming in too far there. I'm pulling off just a nice kind of even strip. This is another sort of thing you want to think about. A lot of crafts are like this. With wood or metal, if you can take off like long, even pieces, it's going to be so much easier than just like taking off little chunks or something and you're going to get into trouble. So I'm holding my knife like this. This is... I'm resting everything on that nail of my little pinky here, right? I'm getting this flat. Sometimes you even have to work off the side of the uh, the stone or whatever you're working on to get low enough. And I'm just, you can see, I'm just taking off that colored pencil mark there coming in. And this is called edge pairing, right? I'm just pairing this edge here like this. And this is kind of where the uh, the hybrid knife shape or a round knife can do this too. Really comes in handy because what because there's counterintuitively there's actually dull areas here and here. I can work into the skin more without the tip or the heel cutting into the leather. And I'm pressing down <laughs> pretty hard, right? Because I wanna I wanna make sure that I do not cut through the leather. One guide I have is looking at the change in the color. You see how it's the dye is much lighter here than there. So this is kind of the full thickness of whatever this was. It's, it's lots of different thickness gauges out there. So this is 30, uh, 37 thousandths of an inch thick. This, I know this Micrometer looks like it belongs in a hand-built British racing car, but it's actually made in Chicago and they still make them. And down there here where I've paired, I'm already down to 22. Um, so how, how thin do you pair it, right? Well, it depends what you're doing. For this book, um, which eventually would get covered with the, this is actually a cockerel marbled paper. 
put down. I didn't do any trimming out. I just pared the leather thin enough that there's no kind of join or, or you don't feel it. And it just overlaps the leather a tiny bit. So it's paired about this thin. This is down to about uh, probably seven or eight thousandths of an inch thick. That's what I'll do on this just for uh, for this. If I were doing something for conservation, it would probably be... I would leave it as thick as I could to get the uh, the kind of aesthetics and the, the function that I needed. Uh, if the leather's too thick, especially in the joint areas, the, the book's going to move. The It's not going to open well. It's just going to, when you open it, it's going to kind of going to push itself off. And you can see, you know, you can see the thickness of the leather right here where I haven't put down the paste down yet. Question about how you use the knife. Does the edge of the blade ever touch or rest along the stone while you're cutting? Not when I do it. <laughs> I know some people do that and you end up scratching up your stone or, or really dulling your knife. So first of all, this this tip is rounded and dull, um, but you want to try to avoid doing that. So, you know, I I don't use this litho stone a lot, but there's no place where I've I've scratched into it. So if you're if you're if your tip of your knife is digging in, it's usually two things you might want to address. One is that your knife is held at too high of an angle. The other is that your tip is pointing past the point here too much. So I don't know if you noticed when I was edge pairing, my tip is very close to the edge here. This also allows me to get closer. Right so here, I, you know, I lost a little bit, but that's no problem. This this goes down to like nothing there, that, that area. That's a, that's This is kind of like the final. Yeah, that's a eight thousandths of an inch there. So that's about as as thin as you know it has no strength at that point here i was just kind of experimenting pairing a piece little piece of leather as, as thin as i could and you can see you kind of end up going through the peaks and the valleys but this was this is, what this was this is super thin oh yeah this is about six thousandths of an inch so it's uh, as thin as you'd ever need to go So edge pairing, you're really only going to be able to pair in a, about an inch or so. If you go further in that, you either have to use some kind of round knife with a kind of a scraping action, which would be, you know, like this, this sort of thing. Or, a, uh, or the hybrid knife, which can do the same thing. And I don't know if you saw that, but the leather can often kind of bunch up and you want to avoid that because that will, you'll cut right through it. We kind of got a little bit spoiled, I think, binders or, or maybe the collectors. Um, I mean, everybody these days, would it, they would not accept a book, I think, that had a hole in it or something. In the 18th century, for example, Duden, who wrote a fabulous bookbinding manual, he talks about one of the reasons they do the staining on the leather is to hide all the holes. And I, I, if you look closely at a lot of 18th century calf books, they almost all have a patch somewhere on them. So it's kind of our uh, idea of, of uh, I don't know, just wholeness or something that a, a, a newly bound book would not have a patch on it. Uh, I, I can't imagine somebody would uh, accept that these days. Okay, so somebody was asking about sharpening. So I'm I'm feeling like it's, it's taken me a little, it's a little harder to, to press. So I'm just going to strop this. I don't know if people, it's just a uh, strop here. I'll just, I'll show the whole process here. Uh, strop is just a, a piece of leather. Um, in this case, this is a horse butt. But I, uh, it seems to hold up better with the stropping, um, so that's the only reason I use it. It's not uh, magical or anything. And I just put a little baby oil on the, this is a 0.5 micron honing compound. It just helps kind of melt it. And you just scribble it on. And I kind of, some people like to wear gloves to do this, but I'm not. So you just scribble it on until you get something like 
like this. And you can see like all these dark spots, uh, that is metal. Those are metal particles that are, they're point, in fact, they're 0.5 micron <laughs> sized metal particles that have come off the, the knife when I'm stropping. So I'm just gonna charge this up a little bit more. And for stropping for a curved blade like this, I'm holding this at my bevel angle, which in this case, it's a super, super tiny bevel, but that's at 13 degrees. And I'm just gonna roll through the whole thing perpendicular to the cutting edge, right? So I'm starting on the bottom here and I'm kind of rolling through and ending on the tip there. Is it possible to use up a stroke and where do you get the honing compound? I, I sell the honing compound uh, any woodworking store, like Tools for Working Wood or Lee Valley sells. Uh, there's a ton of different honing compounds. I generally just use this, right? It's chromium oxide, the pigment, so that's why it's green. I just use that. So you can get that just about anywhere. I do that for the preliminary. So I've stropped that, and then I like to do a, uh, I have a, this is a 0 0.025 micron diamond paste on this side, just as a final strop. Some people like to do that. My friend Joel at Tools for Working Wood, he likes to use just a naked piece of horse butt for his final stropping with nothing on it. He, and uh, you know, <laughs> I, I've tried a lot of different things. Some people really like to use kangaroo because it's thin and tough. To be honest, I, I can't tell a huge difference in a lot of these things. So it's kind of whatever you like, really, whatever you have. Even just some, a plain piece of calf as a secondary stropping, you know, can just gives a little tooth to the blade and helps it to dig in. Can you use up so, a strop? Can, can you use it up? So compound will become glazed over with the metal particles. And if that happens, you can just scrape it off with a knife and then you can put more compound on. So I don't think you can use up a strop. You can damage a strop if you jab your knife in there and have a big hole, which, you know, is not the end of the world, but you just kind of have to remember to work around that. So the stropping is takes place with the compound interacting with the blade, not so much the substrate of the horse butt in this case. Okay. Oh yeah. I can feel a huge difference now. That's just, that's just sailing. So I'm taking off some, I think I'm going a little different angle here. And what I want is just to have, I'm just going to work on this one side here for a minute. Um, just to get this this whole thing as smooth and even as I can. And the knife just kind of feels what it, what it, where it needs to go, right? I'm holding it almost flat here and just, just removing, I mean, these are super thin pieces, right? That's a 6,007 inch. So a piece of paper is about five. So just to give you an idea. And I like to come in from different angles when I'm working on this. And usually I'll be working on kind of, you know, at this point, I'll uh, kind of switch and work all the way around because I do want to get this paired just a little inside where the board's going to hit. So when I fold it over, um, the board is, you know, looks nice and crisp and all that kind of stuff. People regard as a... Uh, a sign of a, a well-made book. And it also helps with the functioning of the book. So I'm kind of doing this number two stroke there, the long one. Coming in flat and Tom Conroy, who's a bookbinder in the Bay Area, he, he likens pairing and I think very aptly to, to flying almost because you're thinking about your knife uh, the pitch of it like this way and that way. Um, generally, uh, something about 45 degrees here is a good way to start. Uh, you're thinking about your knife this way and that way, how, how steep of a, a, a bevel you're making or how uh, shallow. And you really do sort of feel like you're just kind of flying through the leather when you get to, when you get going and you kind of get a, 
like here I can I can just feel like I'm and it's it's amazing like I can I can just move my knife a degree or two and I'll be taking off a little more or a little less as I'm kind of sinking in right there you know taking off that And, uh, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> there's a fair amount of leather already that I've taken off that. Um, but it's, it's kind of amazing sometimes how much leather um, you will take off. So, uh, this is the cap area here, right? These were the, this is the spine. And the board was about here. For the cap area, I'm going to kind of make a cut in, no, not quite so much, in a little bit like this, and then take out a lot of this leather you know, there too. It'll just help get a, a good looking head cap. So, you know, not a great one, but that's okay. In modern fine binding, it's kind of the head caps in the corners are the uh, fetish things on a, on a fine binding that people uh, inspect at competitions and that sort of thing. So I'm coming in, you see I'm also taking a little off the spine here. So the reason I can do that is my knife's not cutting through the leather at the edges, which is, so if you have a straight knife, you're not going to be able to do this. If you have a curved knife, I'd recommend kind of dulling the uh, edges a bit. I don't know if you can see the color change here, but I can see it quite uh, you know, kind of dramatically. I don't know if it's dramatic. And I'm just, I'm pressing down and I'm kind of here, I'm just kind of swooping up and down to, to cut through that uh, area there. Um, let me, uh, do you want to, is there, is there another question, Anita? Let me change the camera position here. I'll put it like maybe a little lower looking at this way to give people an idea of what I'm doing. How's that look? Does that give people, I might give you a better idea of kind of what I'm, how I'm holding this here. So I've got my little pinky and there, and I'm just, I'm just coming in. And, you know, don't underestimate the power of stropping. I mean, I, I am like always stropping. And if I'm stropping, um, I can probably keep a knife going for, you know, it depends how many bindings I'm doing, but a couple dozen, really. And what kind of a pencil was that that you used to mark the leather? Oh, yeah, this is a barrel Prismacolor, which I know it sounds, they're kind of like sold as stone grade uh, <laughs> colored pencils, but they're actually the, the most conservationally accepted colored pencil too by like paper conservators and things because they're, uh, they're pigmented and they're not dyed like a lot of them. It doesn't really matter, I think. Just, you know, I have darker ones to use on lighter colored skins and that sort of, but I, c I could just, I mean, this just brought the knife back. I mean, it's unbelievable how much sharper it is, right? Just that little stropping, 12, 12 strokes on each side. And you know, it's, it's for me, it's, it's really fun uh, to pair. Uh, I guess I would have been a forwarder in a, a past life. Traditionally, there were in English bookbinding, there were sort of two different branches of bookbinding. Forwarders are the ones that, uh, you know, Rounded and back the book. They got it from the sewer, who was always a woman. They would round and back the book, trim the edges, get the boards on, pair the leather, and put the leather on. Then they would give it to the finisher who did the finishing, which is the gold tooling and that sort of stuff. So I I think I would have been a forwarder if I would have been a, a bookbinder in the 19th or 18th century even. But as Johnson said, all you need is a sharp knife and confidence, right? So have you ever used a machine like a Tormek or a sh for sharpening knives? I have. I usually, I do it by hand or I have a, a belt grinder, which is a, uh, it's just a belt that moves very fast. The nice thing about the Tormek is it's very clean, <laughs> right? Because it's a water cooled wheel. Uh, you have no risk of burning uh, your metal. 
a lot of the bookbinding knives are kind of complex shapes, so there's really no way to clamp it in a jig or, or I don't know how you would mount. I mean, I guess you could just lay this against the bar on the tarmac, but I, I think it would be extremely awkward. I, I, the way I sharpen is I, I just, I use my, uh, right here. I just use these, uh, this 3M micro finishing film that I put on a stand that I make. Uh, and I, I do it all the sharpening by hand the, for, for two reasons. Well, for more than two reasons. One is a lot of the bookbinding knives have weird handles that you can't clamp a jig onto or something. Secondly, the, the kind of hand skills that you need to learn to sharpen, holding the knife at 13 degrees or whatever you're going to hold it at, those directly correlate to the hand skills that you're going to use when you're pairing. So you can't share a knife. You can't give the knife to somebody else to sharpen. You might want to give it to somebody else to regrind, but then the sharpening and stropping are going to be up to you because it's amazingly subtle. Sometimes when I'm stropping, even if I do it, say too long on the bevel, the knife will dive like down and I'll have to do the back a little more to even that up. So you, you can really tell uh, it's, it, get, it gets to be very, very subtle kind of when you're pairing. So that's, it, it all creates this kind of knowledge, this craft knowledge base uh, of, of cutting. And, you know, back to the big questions about craft, right? I mean, making a knife or, or being able to use a knife and maintain a cutting edge. I mean, that is one of the, 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 the or craft skills, I think for wherever you're cooking or woodworking or, or uh, whatever, right? It's, it's just, it's so important. And it's, it's, you know, it's, again, it's a skill that you have to, you have to learn. So you're not going to just magically pick it up and do it. So I would suggest learning freehand sharpening. Um, there's, there's probably too much information on the, uh, on the internet about all this kind of stuff, which makes it more confusing, but you know, any system can work. So pick out your, your system, whether you want to use the three M finishing film. I like that cause you can get started pretty inexpensively. You know, diamond stones are great. The new ceramic water stones are great. It kind of, it depends on a lot of subtleties um, of, of what kind of steel you're using. And a lot of times you don't even know. So I'm just doing some, Long strokes there. Thank you, Jeff. That was great. That was just really, really interesting and amazing. 